My people, today we're talking about the Shrine of Challenge and the harder minds that come with it. By the end of this video, you're going to know the enemies that lie ahead, some loot you can expect to find along the way, and most importantly, the most efficient way to get radioactive ore. This is a long one, so we'll get right into it, but first, leaving a like helps this video a ton and subscribing goes a long way, since less than 8% of you are currently subscribed. I also stream live at twitch.tv slash unsurpassablez, and we do all sorts of fun stuff over there, and I'd love to have you. The very first opportunity you're given to take on these harder caves comes from accepting Key's quest, Danger in the Deep. When you do so, your minds will be changed and you'll find that the elevator has been reset. Only by taking on the challenge one level at a time will you be able to make your way to the bottom. If you successfully make your way to floor 120, you'll come face to face with the Shrine of Challenge. Interacting with it will give you the option to toggle the difficulty of the minds between regular and hard, which will take effect on the following day. Let's take a quick look at your inventory so that you know how to prepare. You'll obviously need a pickaxe so that you can break your way through the rocks, and the higher quality the better, but honestly by the time you're completing the hard mode of the mines, you'll likely already have an iridium pick and a high amount of energy. Having the efficient, powerful, or swift forge enchantments on your pick could also make a nice addition, but they're not necessary. You can technically use any weapon that you want, but you'll want at least a galaxy level weapon or else you won't really be able to do any sort of real damage to enemies. Whether you use a sword, a dagger, or a hammer is entirely up to you, but here's my best picks for each category of weapon. There can be a lot more enemies on these floors than you might expect, so having a good weapon will go a long way. If you want more info on the infinity weapons, I made a whole video on them that you can watch right here. As you know, some foods in the game provide you with a stat boost when you consume them. If you already have an effect active from one of these foods and you eat another food that has a stat boost, you'll lose the first one. However, if you eat a normal food item like cheese, your boost remains unaffected. Drinks that provide a special effect like coffee actually stack with your food buffs, so you don't have to worry about picking one or the other. For this reason, you'll want to bring three different kinds of food with you. A buff food, a buff drink, and regular food just to heal you. There's a lot of good options for your buff food, but I think some of the best options are pumpkin soup, spicy eel, lucky lunch, and the magic rock candy. For your drink, take coffee if you want to increase your speed, or ginger ale if you want an increase in luck. One really great benefit to using ginger ale is it actually cures the nausea effect that we'll talk about later in this video. So if you opt for coffee, you'll probably want to bring regular ginger to alleviate this concern. Also, if you want to give yourself an easier time, you should bring an oil of garlic, because for 10 minutes after you drink it, you won't run into any infested floors, and you won't have to deal with a bunch of flying enemies swarming you at once. Conveniently, the oil of garlic actually falls under the special effect buff, meaning it won't cancel out either of your other effects. Something that will make your journey a hundred times easier is having staircases, even if it's only a few of them. Since you can skip entire levels with a staircase, you theoretically could just craft 120 of them and then not have to worry about any of the floors at all. Staircases cost 99 stone a piece to craft, and that's pretty expensive, so it's probably actually better for you to save up jades that you make in your crystallariums, and then trade them into the desert trader on Sundays. Even if you only have a few though, they're super helpful for skipping a level that's taking you a long time to get through or is overrun with monsters. You should wear the best boots that you have, like the mermaid boots or the cinder clown shoes. Defense reduces the amount of damage that you take, and immunity lowers your chance of being affected by a debuff. Rings can be pretty in-depth, especially since you can use the forge to combine them now, so if you want a full breakdown, you'll have to watch my rings guide. I'd recommend having at least one ring that glows, like the Iridium Band, so that you can see in the darker levels. Similar to the normal mines, each section of levels has its own unique theme, housing different enemies, treasures, and challenges. We're going to look through each of the sections one at a time and break down what you can expect to see. Also, I'll only cover the new monsters in depth, since a lot of the bad guys are just harder versions of the ones you're used to. Floors 1 through 29 feature a blue underwater theme. There's a variety of monsters, but one of the new ones is the blue squid. They behave like the magma sparkers from the volcano dungeon, charging up a dash attack and then dealing between 18 to 30 damage. Occasionally, they will charge up a shot that will give you minus 20 attack for 10 seconds, greatly reducing the amount of damage that you deal. A good strategy is trying to predict where they will dash to and getting a hit in while they aren't moving towards you. There's also the stronger variant of the flying bug found in the normal caves. They don't have armor like the ones in the skull cavern, so you can actually do damage to them, and they typically hit around 11 to 18. One difference is that when they're hit, they'll actually choose a random direction to continue flying in. So if you're not aware of this difference or you aren't paying attention, they could get a hit off on you, but otherwise you shouldn't have to worry about them. The blue slime is just like all of the other slimes that you're used to, but the stacked slime is a little different. When you hit a stacked slime, a projectile will be launched directly away from it and it will proceed to bounce off of the walls. It can bounce a lot of times and if it ever hits you it'll deal damage and could provide the slowness debuff. Also in this section there are duggies and the rock crabs. These first 30 floors actually have a lot of really good forageable items like coral, clams, sea urchins, and even rainbow shells. Being able to find clams here was super helpful for me when I was building my ocean obelisk, since clams can be somewhat rare to come by otherwise. Floors 30 through 39 feature a dark and shadowy theme. You can run into flying bugs, bats, or stone golems while you're on these levels, just like in floor 30 to 39 of the regular mines. You'll also have a chance of bumping into the carbon ghosts that you see in the skull caverns, and they can pack quite a punch. Overall though, these are enemies that you're used to and you should be able to make your way through with ease. 
Personally, I actually found floors 41 through 69 to be the hardest ones with its enchanted forest type of theme. You're used to seeing frost bats, slimes, dust sprites, and grubs, even if they look a little different from what they normally do, but my favorite little new guy is the stick bug. He disguises himself as a harvestable piece of wood, but once he gets close to you, he pounces. <laughs> also, the most viewed thing I've ever created was a dumb stick bug TikTok back in September, so I like that he reminds me of that. Additionally, while you're on this floor, you'll run into spiders that lunge towards you. While they're in the air, they can't be hit, and they jump at inconsistent intervals, so I found myself taking a lot of damage from them. Just let them land, get some hits in, and when they jump, run away. You also need to be careful you don't step in one of their spider webs, or else you'll be slowed down. Potentially the most brutal enemy on these levels is the putrid ghost. The thing that makes them so bad is they will occasionally hit you with the nausea effect, which prevents you from healing with food for two minutes of real time. This can feel like an eternity and immediately halt your progress, but consuming either ginger or ginger ale will get rid of it. Floors 71 through 79 have a frozen castle theme and aren't really all that bad. Skeletons are nothing new and you've seen the haunted skulls in the quarry mine before, but the one new enemy is the skeleton mage. His only unique characteristic is that he'll freeze you in place for two seconds, making it easier to take damage. As long as you keep swinging though, you should be fine. Floors 81 through 119 have a bunch of enemies that you're used to, like slimes, lava bats, lava crabs, metalheads, shadow brutes, shadow shamans, and squid kids. But the shadow sniper is new, and if he hits you, there's a chance he'll turn your entire screen black for four seconds. You can still attack and mine while this happens, but it can be disorienting, so be careful. As for the strategy, before you head in, you'll want to eat your buff food, buff drink, and oil of garlic. Make your way through the mines like you normally do, breaking rocks along the way, and killing enemies that bother you. Killing enemies has a 15% chance of spawning a ladder, and there's around a 2% chance that you'll get one every time you break a rock. If this is your first time and you're trying to complete danger in the deep, you'll want to make sure you get through at least 20 floors a day to make sure that you finish on time. Honestly, you guys have been through combat like this before, so half the battle is just knowing what to expect and being properly prepared for it. So if you watch the rest of this video, you'll be okay. Finally, I'll talk about the main reason everybody wants to do the harder version of the mines, getting radioactive ore. You can get this in the harder versions of either the regular mines or the Skull Cavern, but you'll have a much better time in the regular ones. When I made this video, there was actually very little information about how radioactive ore worked, so that's why I decided to decompile Stardew Valley's base code and spend about three hours taking a look for myself. Please keep in mind I am by no means a coder, but I think I've got everything right here. Line 11,341 of the file gamelocations.cs describes how many radioactive ore you can get per node. Basically this says if you break a radioactive node, you should spawn multiple radioactive ores. How many of them? Pick a random number, either one or two, and add an extra ore if they have the minor profession. Add an extra one if their luck from buffs and rings is higher than a randomly generated number, and add one more if their mining level is higher than a different randomly generated number. On line 3853 of the file mineshafts.cs, we see the equation that determines whether or not a radioactive node will spawn on a given tile. We see right in the beginning of the line that a node will literally never spawn on a level that has an elevator, which is super important because now you know to not even waste your time trying to elevator hop between each floor just looking for radioactive nodes. We also see that ore is more likely to spawn when you have a higher daily luck value and when you're deeper in the mines. I believe the variable average daily luck that's mentioned here refers to the luck you get when you check the fortune teller in the morning, but has nothing to do with the luck buff you receive from foods or lucky rings. I don't know if all of this is correct, but it seems like the number of ores that you get from a node is dependent on your luck buffs, mining level, mining profession, and an extra random bit. And the number of nodes that spawn is dependent on your floor and your daily luck. Taking all of this into consideration, the absolute best way to hunt for radioactive ore is to wait for a day with good daily luck, throw on your luck rings, pop a miner's treat or a lucky lunch, then head to floor 110 in the mines and head down the ladder immediately. Sweep through floors 111 to 114, then once you reach floor 115, take the elevator back up and reset your mines by walking outside and going back in. And obviously you should make sure you have the miner profession to get every little bit of ore that you can. Guys, this one took a lot of research, so leaving a like is very appreciated. And don't forget I stream at twitch.tv slash unsurpassablez. I would love to have you guys there. That's all I've got for this video, though. I will see you in the next one. Peace.